We're continuing Protestant Reformation. I want to say this is part six of our, the section on Protestant Reformation. And as far as total lesson, I think it's lesson number 30-something. I don't have it written down here. I have it written down somewhere else. Um, but I think we're in the upper 30s for lessons now, mid to upper 30s. But um, Protestant Reformation, and we finished with the Arminians last week. And we're going to pick up with the Huguenots, um, who were a Protestant group in France. Uh, so one of the things that is important to, to point out is that there were different names for these groups in different parts of the world, or I should say different parts of Europe. Uh, so one country, they might have been called one name, and uh, another country, they were called other names. And maybe there were certain key individuals who led them in one country compared to another country. and so. But overall, the influence goes back to uh, John Calvin and, and, the, and the Reformed theology. Uh, the Huguenots uh, were uh, influenced, as I've said, by, as I just said, by Calvin's theology and practice. And these were French uh, Protestants. They, the, the Roman Catholic Church dominated France in the 1500s. Uh, for example, French Bibles couldn't be printed in France and had to be smuggled in from Switzerland and elsewhere. Uh, and Calvin's writings were also brought in. And so anywhere the Catholic Church dominated, they, they tried to uh, uh, stamp out the scriptures, prohibit the distribution or printing of the scriptures. It was a common practice for them at that time. Uh, in spite of the Inquisition, there were large numbers of Protestants in France. And by 1559, an estimated 10% were aligned with the Protestant cause, and there were more than 2,000 congregations. Now, 10% doesn't seem like a lot, considering that that's 90% that aren't. But once you have 10% of a population uh, that would be aligned with that a cause or part of a certain religion, that still uh, brings a little more potential for influence in a country, in a society. Uh, if you, um, now, it's still going to be small. Uh, but there's going to be at least a presence there. I mean, think about here in Greenfield, if one out of every 10 people walking around was a Bible-believing Christian, um, we would say, and I don't know what the, um, and I don't know what the, the uh, ratio is of Bible-believing Christians to non-Bible-believing Christians in Greenfield is, but I can't imagine it's 1 in 10. Um, but to think about if it was 1 in 10, chances are one out of every 10 people you see would be a Bible-believing Christian to say, wow, that's, there, there's at least a presence there. And so uh, that was the way it was there in France, even though it was still dominated in large part by the Catholic Church. Uh, there were 10% were aligned with the Protestant cause, and there were more than 2,000 congregations. Uh, many of the educated class, merchants, financiers, lawyers, and other professionals followed Protestantism. Many of these kind of people, however, were not truly regenerated. They were not truly believers uh, and they only adopted the Protestant cause for political and economic reasons. Because you think about with the Catholic Church, wherever the Catholic Church was ruling, it brought a lack of opportunity, a lack of freedom. And so a cause that is going to be promoting uh, freedom, even if it's primarily meant for freedom of religion, um, there's others that are going to latch on to that to a certain degree, even if they're not completely on board with the uh, beliefs of that people. And there were many wars between the Catholics and Protestants in France. Uh, France was divided into various groups of nobility, all of whom were vying for power. Some were Catholic and others were Protestant. Many wars were fought between them. The Huguenots were fighting largely in self-defense and self-preservation in the land. They just wanted to be able to stay there. Uh, they had finally succeeded in getting the king to sign a peace treaty they simply wanted to live in peace and worship God according to their conscience. And uh, that was not going to last, however. Uh, this, uh, there's uh, what's called the Massacre of St. Bartholomew in 1572. So after King Henry in 1559, his three young sons ruled in succession, but Henry's wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, was the real power. She was a staunch Catholic and hated the Protestants. She and others devised a plan to destroy the Huguenots by inviting them to a wedding. The leader of the Huguenots at this time was a brave and just man named Gaspard uh, de Coligny. 
uh, when the Huguenots were unsuspectingly settled in various dwellings in Paris for the wedding, they were set upon, there was a certain signal that was given, and they were set upon by mobs who indiscriminately murdered them. And so that means indiscriminately means uh, they didn't care who they killed, they were just going to try to wipe out whoever they could, men, women, children, didn't matter. Uh, they did not discriminate in that way. They first killed Caligny in his bedroom and threw his body out the window onto the street below. During the next three days, at least 4,000 Huguenots were barbarically murdered and thousands of others were murdered outside of Paris during the next two months. When word of this atrocity reached Rome, Pope Gregory XIII called for a celebration. They actually had a special mass. Um, they actually had a, a special mass and a big celebration. And I mean, they were just going all out uh, in just reveling in this, uh, this massacre. And that just is a great indication of their hearts of, of hatred and wickedness toward these people, uh, that they would not only do those things, but then just absolutely uh, celebrate it um, with uh, shamelessly uh, celebrating what, was, uh, what had taken place. The, uh, in 1598, King Henry IV of France granted some liberty to the Huguenots in the Edict of Nantes. Um, they were allowed to raise and educate their children in their own religious faith, to worship according to the dictates of their conscience, and to hold public office, and to have access to universities and hospitals. And this was the case for 87 years. And from Encyclopedia Britannica, um, it's uh, quoted there that uh, the edict was accompanied by Henry IV's own conversion from Huguenot Calvinism to Roman Catholicism and brought an end to the violent wars of religion that began in 1562. So here's someone who was a Huguenot, even though he turned Catholic, he still allowed them some, uh, some liberty. Uh, the controversial edict was one of the first decrees of religious tolerance in Europe and granted unheard of religious rights to the French Protestant minority. The edict upheld Protestants in freedom of conscience and permitted them to hold public worship in many parts of the kingdom, though not in Paris. It granted them full civil rights, including access to education and established a special court composed of both Protestants and Catholics to deal with disputes arising from the edict. Protestant pastors were to be paid by the state and released from certain obligations Militarily, the Protestants could keep the places they were holding in, in, uh, in August 1597 as strongholds for eight years, the expenses of garrisoning them being met by the king. The edict also restored Catholicism in all areas where Catholic practice had been interrupted and made any extension of Protestant worship in France legally impossible. So this was, in certain ways, granted them a reprieve from the wars, from the persecution, but at the same time was still as really reestablishing Catholicism as the official religion uh, in, a, in a bigger way. Nevertheless, it was much resented by Pope Clement VIII and by the Roman Catholic clergy in France and by the parliaments. Um, Catholics tended to interpret the edict in its most restrictive sense the Cardinal de Richelieu, who regarded its political and military clauses as a danger to the state, annulled them by the Peace of Alice in 1629. On October the 18th, 1685, Louis XIV uh, formally revoked the Edict of Nantes and deprived the French Protestants of all religious and civil liberties. Within a few years, more than 400,000 persecuted Huguenots emigrated to England, Prussia, Holland, and America, depriving France of its most industrious commercial class. And so the tables turned again. Uh, so they had some reprieve, but then tables turned again uh, a number of years later, and uh, then they, many of them uh, left uh, France. King, which is uh, described right here um, by King Louis XIV, and then we, so, so that's uh, really the end of, of uh, Huguenots, what we have to say about them. Uh, the Anglican Church we'll look at next, begin looking at today. Uh, the Church of, it's also known as the Church of England. Um, here in America, they're called primarily Episcopal churches. Uh, so there's different terms, but going, really tracing back to the same thing. Uh, the Church of England was formed in 1534 when King Henry VIII 
rebelled against the Roman Catholic Pope and proclaimed himself the head of a national church in England. Now, the, the reason for this uh, was not because of some theological differences. Uh, King Henry VIII had no problem with the Catholic doctrine for the most part, except for the fact that he was upset that the king wouldn't grant him, I'm sorry, the pope would not grant him an annulment or a divorce um, of, his, his, of his first wife. And um, so he was angry about that, and so he said, all right, well, forget you, I'm going to start my own church where I can <laughs> do, those, do those things that I want. And um, Henry's wives were... Cath uh, Catherine of Aragon, first wife was Catherine of Aragon, mother of future Queen Mary I. Anne Boleyn, mother of future Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, Jane Seymour, um, uh, not the modern day Jane Seymour. If you know, be Jane Seymour, Dr. Quinn. Anybody remember Dr. Quinn? Okay. Now that wasn't her real name. Her real name, that was her screen name. But she's named Jean, she called herself Jane Seymour after this queen. Um, the modern day Jane Seymour, who's the English actress, apparently is a Canadian actress too, I, I don't know. But her name was Joyce Penelope Wilhelmina Frankenberg, is her real name. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> has nothing to do with the Anglican Church, but I thought I'd, except she is from England, so. Um, but anyway, but interestingly enough, um, the English actress has been married and divorced four times, so there's another relation close to King Henry VIII. Um, he has her beat, but um, uh, anyway, so for Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, uh, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. Uh, King Henry VIII evidently liked women named Catherine um, as well. So married and divorced six times. Uh, King Henry, he was had six wives so you can tell what kind of guy he was he was just um, not a morally upstanding citizen but he um, Henry remained Catholic in his doctrine for all of his life and hated Protestants the Church of England took a more Protestant turn when Henry died and his son Edward the sixth took the throne Edward was the son of Jane Seymour uh, Henry's third wife so um, so a lot of a lot of stuff going on. You had Ma Queen Mary, future Queen Mary, uh, future Queen Elizabeth coming from Henry VIII, and you had uh, uh, Edward. Uh, so, I mean, all kinds of a pretty split family tree there when it comes to the, to the wives. Under Edward, there was liberty for the distribution of and reading the Word of God. And uh, so there uh, was really, that was the major change, a shift uh, of the Church of England um, that came after Henry VIII. Um, progress was made to conform the Church of England to a Protestant pattern of doctrine and practice, such as Mass being abolished, services held in English rather than Latin. Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer wrote a Protestant confession of faith that eventually became the 39 Articles of the Church of England. Cranmer's statement of faith contained many heresies, such as uh, baptism as part of salvation and infant baptism. There was not complete religious liberty as two Baptists were burned during Edward's reign. Uh, Edward's reformation of the Church of England was short-lived. Uh, he had become king at age nine, uh, but uh, he died only six and a half years later at age 16 in 1553. And so a, a, he was a very young king and a very short-tenured king. Um, but uh, in that time, and uh, he, he did uh, effect some change. And what we're going to find uh, uh, next week, we're going to finish with the Anglican Church next week. Uh, but what we're going to find is that the tables would turn again um, and uh, things were going to get pretty messy and ugly uh, as following his death. Well, apparently I didn't prepare enough notes on the PowerPoint. Um, because that's it. I thought I had enough. Yeah.